alaikum, my dear participants, uh, to another session of our Islam study circle. Uh, as is our custom, we study certain texts in the first part, and in the second part, we discuss a particular misconception uh, regarding Islam. Uh, as you can see, the text that I've selected, as far as the Quran is concerned, it is being displayed uh, right before you on the screen. It is actually verse 285 of Surah Baqarah. Uh, I'll just read out the verse to you and its translation, and uh, we can discuss uh, its uh, uh, meanings and some of the other details right after that. So uh, it says, "Amana Rasul bima unzila ilayhi min Rabbihi wal mu'minun kullun amana billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusuli la nufarriku bayna ahadim min rusuli wa qalu sami'na wa ata'ana ghufranaka rabbana wa ilayka al -masir. The messenger has believed in what has been revealed to him by his Lord. And so have the believers. All of them have professed faith in God, his angels, his books, and his messengers. They assert, we do not differentiate between any of God's messengers. And they said, we have heard and have obeyed. Lord, we seek your forgiveness and believe that on the day of judgment, to you shall we return. So uh, you can see, my dear participants, uh, from this verse that it clearly spells out the tenets of faith that we often come across uh, are in our textbooks, when we teach our children, when we ourselves went through a study course on Islam. Uh, this, this is a basic uh, lesson that, uh, that is uh, placed right at the beginning of any course on Islam. It deals with the tenets of faith. And to uh, I would like to uh, inform you that basically it is this verse of the Quran uh, which spells out the tenets of Islam, the five tenets of Islam or the five pillars of faith of Islam. And as you can see, it starts off by saying that the messengers of God and the companions, which means the earliest Sahaba, they have believed, they have accepted faith, they have professed faith. And in what have they professed faith? This is what is being suggested here. It's about what being delineated here. It says, Kullun amana billah. First of all, they believe in God. And what does that mean? It means that they believe that, the God, that God is their Lord. He is their creator. He is the one who is the sole deity. He is to be worshipped. No one can be associated with him. He has to be relied upon. And I always say that our biggest and strongest support is the Almighty. All supports are temporary. Our closest of friends, our closest of uh, acquaintances, they pass away. They are not always with us. If we have someone with us, it is God. That is why his uh, introduction in the Quran often says, hey, wa qayyum, that he, he always exists because this is a, an assurance that we all need, that he is always with us right from the time that we need him when we open our eyes as mature adults till our last breath, we can depend upon him. But you see, the, the important thing here is that all of us are weaklings. We are weak individuals. We need someone to rely upon. We need someone to talk to. We need someone to trust. We need someone to obey as a superior being, as, a, as someone who has created us. So the first thing that this verse spells out is that you have, you have believed in God. God is an entity. He is our essential need. He is someone whom we can depend upon. And that is why, dear viewers, I, I often speak about this, that we have to have a strong God connection. The stronger our connection with God, the stronger will be we internally. And when I say stronger we be internally, it means that we will be stronger in order to face the trials of life. We will be stronger to face the problems of life if we have God on our side and if we have God to depend upon, to look up to. Uh, we can clearly see that our connection with God, the stronger it is, the stronger will be our response to uh, these uh, trials and tribulations. And since this world has been created such that trials and tribulations are an essential part of our life, we are tried and tested. And during these times of trials, and tribulations, we pass through a lot of low and high points in life. And whenever we feel low, we need, the, we need the company of God. We need someone to talk to. We need 
someone whom we can turn to and depend upon. So that is why it is essential that the foremost tenet of faith is the Almighty Himself, the Supreme Creator, the Supreme Being, the one who has created the universe, the one who is omniscient, the one who is omnipresent, the one who is going to call everyone to account one day, as we shall see uh, as uh, the topic of the verse also. Now, the second thing which the verse mentions is Malaika, which means the angels. And this has been mentioned because angels are our connection with the Almighty. The Almighty does not directly communicate with human beings, it, but we need to know what are what is the means through which he communicates. So the verse points out that, uh, that we have to understand that God is not aloof. He is not someone who is beyond our connection and our relationship. There are intermediaries who connect us with the Almighty, who bring his messages down to human beings. And they are this genre of uh, human beings called angels. So angels are this, these uh, beings who actually, at the behest of the Almighty, are running the affairs of, this king, of his kingdom. And of course, uh, we do understand that the Almighty did not need to have these angels uh, to govern his, uh, or to, to help him out in governing his state of affairs. But he has actually appointed them so that they can also communicate his messages to uh, his uh, creation. The third thing which is mentioned as a precept or a tenet of faith is Kutubihi, which means the books of God. Now, what we need to understand and perhaps note here is that it's not says Kitab, or it does not say that the Quran, it says Kutub, all the books of God. And I think that this is a very essential and a very noteworthy thing that we have to believe in all the books of God, on all the scriptures of the Almighty, because they have been sent down by the Almighty. We cannot, uh, we cannot adopt the behavior, for example, that we have adopted today, generally, uh, regarding other divine scriptures. Seldom do we have the chance to read the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, uh, this is because that our own connection with the Quran is, uh, is, is so much that uh, we don't even find that we have uh, to connect with previous scriptures as well. So you see, the verse is actually telling us that we need to have this connection with all the books of God, not just the Quran, all the books of God. All the more reason that we read the Quran and understand it, and all the more reason that not only the Quran, but also some of the previous books, and most important of them is the Torah, of course, which is now uh, the it consists of the Old Testament, and then we have the New Testament, and the psalm so these four books uh, which are extant in uh, in our uh, we have them with us they are essential that we believe in them that they are from god we believe them in them that they are uh, they are one of the sources of guidance and of course we must not differentiate and then we see the verse goes on to spell out a fourth thing and that is varusulihi that we have to believe in the messengers of god and again please note the plural it does not say that you have to believe in Muhammad only, which is to whom, of course, we owe our debt. It says, Rusulihi, all the messengers of God. And then the verse does not stop here. It says, La rusuli. Not only the, the Prophet and the companions professed belief in all the messengers of God, they in fact did not differentiate between any one of them. So it says, La no rusuli. We will not differentiate. Now, what does this mean? It means that we will not regard someone to be superior to the other. Each of the prophets have their own status, their own position, but none is to be given an absolute position. All of them have their own relative distinctions, but we will not differentiate. We will not say that we believe in some and not believe in the others. We have to unconditionally believe in all the messengers of God. And I think this is a supreme message of the Quran. It is it is something which embraces, which engulfs everyone. It's a message to humanity which tells us that our ambit are is all the messengers of God, not just Muhammad, the final messenger. And I think this is an area, this is a this is a, a part of the Quran in which we should revel, in which we should feel happy at how the Almighty has actually made this easy for us and how through this we can become a single fraternity. Humankind can become a single fraternity 
because they are not divided into various uh, followers of a particular uh, prophet of God. That division, of course, does exist. But as far as believing and uh, accepting them as messengers are concerned, there is no difference. And then the fifth thing which uh, this verse goes on to say is, Samirna wa Atharna, that we, O oh Lord, we have heard what you have told us. And after hearing that, we present ourselves as people who would obey what you have told us. So it's not just listening. It's not just a question of mere listening. The immediate response is that whatever the Almighty is going to tell us, we are bound to follow it. And you see, the next words are, Rabbana wa al-Masir. Lord, forgive us. And, and we believe that on the day of judgment, to you shall uh, we shall return. So you see, the fifth tenet of faith, which is belief in the day of judgment, although it's not mentioned the way the rest of the tenets are mentioned, but in a very distinctive way, it tells us that the day of judgment is also something that we need to believe in. And of course, uh, there's no need to point this fact that unless we believe in a day of judgment, this world becomes a meaningless place. This world becomes a useless place. It does not give us a very tangible explanation. Uh, it actually confounds us. If this world is all there is, then a number of questions arise. The foremost being that why has the Almighty created this world such that there are people who, in spite of doing good deeds, end up in a lot of problems. And there are people who do bad deeds, they end up right at the top. And we find injustice prevailing. We find people being sacrificed. We find merit being sacrificed. We find so many imperfections. So if this world is all that there is, then of course, we have the supreme question that then what is this whole world all about? Is, is it something which is, uh, which is really something uh, to be proud of, to be uh, a part of, because we think that it's, uh, it's the grand scheme of the almighty? Of course, the answer is well known. So, uh, viewers, we've come to an end to this part of our segment in which we have discussed a Quranic verse. And now let's move on to the hadith uh, that we are going to discuss today. Uh, this hadith is actually found in the Sahih of Imam Muslim. And it's a very, very subtle narrative, in fact, I would say. It's a narrative in which if we can understand what the, what the, what the, what the Prophet actually wants to convey we will really feel this this elation this jubilation in our in our inner self it's like a spiritual satisfaction that we will gain let me read out the words and the translation so wo- the words are an abi huraira qala qala rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam ad dunya sijnul mu'min wa jannatul kafir abu huraira stated that god's messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said this world is a prison for a believer and a paradise for a disbeliever. I think it says it all. Now, what we were just discussing earlier on, that if this world is all that there is, then, of course, uh, why should we bother regarding all those moral principles? Why should we bother to go through all that system of merit? Why should we suffer at all? Why should we always not make hay? Why should we not be indulgent in our behavior? So basically, this narrative is something which answers this, that this world is not a world in which we have to indulge ourselves. This world is a world in which we have to pass through certain restrictions. There are certain restrictions that we need to follow. There are certain bounds and limits that we need to always observe. And this is figuratively actually reflected in the words of this hadith by telling us that it's like a prison to a believer. A prison to a believer, of course, means that he is a person of principles. He is bound by certain principles. And as long as he obeys those principles, he has to lead a life of austerity. He has to leave a, lead a life of discipline. On the other hand, it says that paradise, that this world is like a paradise uh, for, for, the, for the disbeliever. Of course, the word disbeliever here means a person who has intentionally denied the Almighty, a person who has intentionally forsaken him. The, the Hadith says that for such people, this world is paradise. And I think this needs absolutely no explanation. And we can clearly see that this world really is paradise for people who would, who, who would like to enjoy its adornments, who would like to enjoy its embellishments uh, and do without any restriction. Because 
if they adopt these restrictions of course it will not bring any joy to them so it's like saying that people who have made up their mind to disobey god who have made up their mind to disobey the truth and not accept the truth for them this world is like a paradise because if you don't accept the almighty if you don't believe in the almighty there is no restriction upon you you can do anything why should you follow a discipline why should you follow a decorum why should you stay away, away from your mothers as far as your sexual needs are concerned why is it that these that these uh, relations have a certain amount of modesty uh, amongst themselves so in in the case of a person who is a non believer uh, this world is like a paradise it offers him so much as you can see the purpose of the prophet is apparently the opposite it says that in fact although this world is like a prison to the believers but if he wants this to be a paradise then of course he'll have to forego many of these restrictions and he needs to look up towards these restrictions and say and think that basically it's the hereafter for which he's going to live his life is the hereafter in which he is going to aspire for those higher ideals in life he is going to give up a lot of things in this world so that he can gain a lot of things in the next world he is going to sacrifice a lot of noble things maybe and a lot of things that might disrupt his life in order to gain those things in the hereafter so it's like sacrificing something for a bigger goal sacrificing something to achieve something high in life we all of us uh, whenever we pass through various circumstances of course the most important thing is that we are people who who would like to become uh, people who achieve high success in the uh, regarding the hereafter and this high success can only only be achieved if we give priority to our, in our undertakings to the life of the hereafter so at another instance the almighty has actually said in the quran that believers are those bal tusirun al hayat ad dunya who when there is a preference between this world and the next world they always give preference to the next world which means the requisites the needs and the challenges which await us for the next world they are they become our top priority so uh, now let's move on to the third part of our segment the third segment and this is of course a bible verse of the day and you let me remind you that the reason that i keep this thing always fresh uh, before you and i've made it a point to include the study of bible in this study circle is precisely what we have just studied earlier on in the quranic verse which says that we believe in all the books of god when we say that we believe in all the books of god the first and the basic requisite of this is that we must study other books of god as well or uh, study other divine scriptures as well so this is the reason that the bible has been included as a text in this study circle and i i'm sure those of you who have gone through the bible at least those parts which we have discussed in these weeks uh, they can see how the almighty is actually speaking although we don't have the original words although we the originals are lost but still the way it, the these books speak to us the way it they convey the message of the almighty it's so very profound it's so moving that one really feels that if one had not studied the bible he would have missed out on a lot of things so with this note let me recite this these uh, four verses or three verses of the bible uh I have taken them from the Gospel of Saint Matthew, chapter number four, verses eighteen and nineteen. So the words are, "And when he, of course, this refers to Jesus, and when he was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, whose other name was Peter, and Andrew, his brother, who were putting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, 'Come after me, and I will make you fishers of men.'" Now uh, this is such a profound, uh, I would say, exposition that it really shakes you and it really uh, gives us this this inspiration that how a prophet of God has used the situation to actually educate and teach some of his disciples. We know that Simon Peter, who's also called Patras in in uh, the Arabic language or uh, in in the in the Urdu language. which as uh, some of the translations say and then we have andrew so simon and andrew basically are two brothers and they are fishermen 
and they are putting their nets in the sea in order to cast fish. Here comes Jesus. He, he comes along and he sees them that he is uh, fishing in the sea, that these two brothers are fishing in the sea so that they can catch fish and earn a livelihood. Look what Jesus says. He says, leave aside this fishing and let's go and catch men or catch people. So instead of catching animals for our fodder, for our consumption, leave this aside and let's go on for a higher ideal in life. And that is, let's try to call people towards God. Let's gather people for the call of God. So don't take these words in their literal sense. It, Jesus is not telling them that they should stop earning their livelihood. Of course, he's not saying that they should give up fishing for their livelihood. All that he is saying is he's stressing that there is something more to life. It's not just uh, it's not just uh, giving our own physical body, the needs of our physical body, uh, all the requisites. But there is a higher goal, and that is that spirituality that we must gain through it. And that is where we can clearly see that probably the uh, most important thing here is that we need to understand that that as human beings, it is essential that all of us make some higher ideal in life prevail in our lives. And that is the biggest ideal that we can achieve is to share the truth, to share the nice things that we have learned, to share what we think is superior with other people. When we communicate good things to other people, it is like sharing what we have with other people. It is like calling them towards God. So this is the this is the lesson which Jesus has actually taught us that just don't fill your bellies with food. It's not just your carnal desires that you have to fulfill. You have a higher goal in life, a much higher goal in life, and that is call people towards the truth, call people towards the Almighty, call people to what righteousness is, call people to what virtue and piety is. And of course, when you say you call people towards these noble acts, it means that you first have to become an example of these acts. So unless you are an embodiment of truth, unless you yourself are someone who is an embodiment of righteousness, how can you influence other people? So in other words, Jesus is implying that not just your bellies that you have to fulfill. It's not just your food that you have to take and nourish your physical bodies. You have to nourish your spiritual self as well. And the way you, you do that is that you communicate righteousness to other people. And you cannot communicate righteousness to other people unless you become righteous yourselves. So this, in a nutshell, I would say, is the message of uh, these verses of uh, the Gospel of St. Matthew. And with this, we come to an end to the first part of our segment of the study circle. And uh, I would welcome any questions that you might be having regarding what we have just studied. So so if you have any questions, please let me. If you see, uh, Rafia Khaja Saab has hand raised. And so if you click on her mic, it will be unmuted. Uh, just let me see. Uh, OK. Right next to her name. Thank you. Salaam alaikum, Shahzad Saab. You mentioned uh, about uh, believing in all the messengers and their books. Uh, Prophet Sallallahu was the last prophet. And then what is the difference between uh, the Quran and the previous books? And is there any difference? I sort of understood that the Quran was the final book and it was like you improve the previous books and the messages. And am I wrong? in? saying this uh, you see what we, what can be said in a nutshell is that the difference between the quran and the previous scriptures is that the only book of god which is available in its original language in its original form the way it was revealed is the quran and hence it is but logical that we have to rely on the quran and read every other divine scripture in the light of the Quran. All other divine scriptures, including the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Psalms, they are basically translations. We do not have the originals with us. All of them have been translated. So these translations can only be judged if we had an original of them, which we don't. 
So therefore, it is now our uh, restriction or we are under compulsion that we have to study these previous scriptures. And if there is a discrepancy between these scriptures and the Quran and the word of the Quran is final, that is what uh, we have to understand. So the difference in an would be that the Quranic scripture or the Quran is found in its ultimate final language in the very form in which it was revealed. And the rest of the scriptures, they exist as translations. Although these translations, most of them present what the truth is actually what it is. But again, there have been distortions, especially in the historical part of these scriptures, which the Quran has corrected in a number of places. And hence, uh, uh, we are very safe when we study these previous scriptures because we have the light of the Quran shining on these scriptures. And if there is a discrepancy, the Quran has corrected them. But other than that, there are some, uh, there are some aspects in which these scriptures are actually explaining the Quran. If they are actually delineating what the Quran is saying, or in other words, they are reinforcing, explaining, corroborating, substantiating what the Quran is saying. So there are certain areas in which there are discrepancies and there are certain areas in which this explanation is actually reinforcing each other. So we have to be uh, wise enough to be uh, to exercise our discretion that wherever there is a discrepancy, the Quran has to prevail. And wherever there is not a discrepancy, then it's like having a reinforcement of the same message in different styles and different words from different prophets of God. As Dr. Shalat, didn't St. Paul uh, change the Old Testament, New Testament, even about Jesus Christ being the Son of God? That is not what the previous belief was. Uh, again, could you correct me, please? So, so what we can say is that Pauline Christianity is an interpretation of St. Paul's uh, own uh, words, but this does not mean that he has changed the, the, the Gospels themselves. He has his own interpretation of these Gospels, what we can say. It's not that he has actually changed the Gospels themselves. So it's like saying that a very senior interpreter of the Gospels has made a certain interpretation of those Gospels, which we might not agree with. However, this would not be correct to say that he has actually changed the scriptures himself. Because uh, what he has done is that he has given dif a different interpretation. Like, for example, he says that that the law of the Torah or the Old Testament is just meant for the Jews. It is not meant for people who profess faith other than uh, the followers. So it's not meant for non-Jews. That's what he said. So basically, he is given a new <laughs> interpretation of the scriptures. He's not changed them. He's given a different interpretation. And if we have uh, the scriptural background with us, we can clearly distinguish between his version and the version of the Bible itself. But calling Jesus the son of God, uh, that wasn't there previously. Of course, you see, that is, that's what we're saying, that, that that distortion has been made by some of the translators. It's not St. Paul himself. We cannot call him guilty of this mis mistranslation. There have been other areas, and I, I think I've explained this earlier on in some of our sessions, that how in Arabic and in Hebrew, the words ab, uh, the word which is used for father is common for father and God. And how the word son is common between son and a servant of God. So like, a, I, like I said, that there are certain common words which have been translated such that the word which was meant for father actually is also meant for God himself. And the, the two have been uh, mixed up, up at certain places. So there are some other, I would say, causes for this mistranslation. It's not that this uh, St. Paul has been uh, responsible for these mistranslations. As I said, his contribution is that he has given Christianity a new interpretation or a different interpretation that we would perhaps not agree with. But uh, I would not say that he has actually changed the Bible. Thank you very much. Muhammad Hashim Saab has a question, if you can unmute her mic. Um, his mic. Um, just a quick request to everyone. Uh, when you have a question and you're following up, in the meantime, if you can mute your mic so there is no background noise. And once you're done, you can mute it as well. So, Rafia Saba, if you can mute your mic, please. Right. Please go ahead. Uh, Hashim Saab's mic uh, is. Uh, uh, is the mic unmuted now? Uh, no, it's still muted. If you can click on it once. 
This is the. Uh, my question is, uh, is Matthew part of the New Testament? What I mean is Injil, or it sounded like this is a Hadith of the. Uh, no, it's part of part of the New Testament. Matthew is one of the Gospels of the New Testament. So there are four canonical Gospels: Luke, Mark, Matthew, and John. So Matthew is one of the, one of these Gospels. Oh, okay. Because the, the way the verse is, it sounded like it's a Hadith of Isa Islam. So this, this proves my point even further, that how close these words of the Prophet Jesus are to our to the, to the words of the Almighty himself and to Muhammad as well. You can very well imagine that a person like you, who has, uh, who has been just told of these uh, verses, he has misconceived them to be perhaps words of the Prophet or the Quran. And this actually tells us that how this common origin of these sources speak for themselves. True. Thank you, John. So I think uh, I don't see any more hands. No, there are no more questions. Thank you. Okay. So uh, let's move on to the next part of our study uh, uh, session. And this next segment. Uh, generally deals with some uh, misconception and the misconception I had in mind to discuss today uh, relates to some of the global happenings that are going on and since one of the uh, happenings that continues to go on is uh, are these incidents these isolated incidents of terrorism uh, in various mosques in various localities in the US in Canada in Australia in the UK uh, and we find Muslims uh, doing these uh, vandalism destructive activities in which they destroy things they kill people in the name of god and they think that they are doing a service to religion and this exactly is the purpose of religion itself and i would I have although tried to discuss this uh, aspects in various uh, sessions but i would like to make a, a rather comprehensive comment today so that uh, we are able to know the origin of this misconception because you see what is happening here is that terrorism vandalism extremism is being justified in the name of the quran so terrorism or extremism or vandalism or call it what you may the people who adhere to this the people who are its advocates they they actually cite certain verses of the quran they cite certain ahadiths of the prophet muhammad and they think that what they are saying is primarily drawn from the Quran itself. That if they are killing some people who they think are not are non-believers, then this is what the Quran has actually told them. And uh, re let me remind you that some of you might know that it was in 1994, in a famous uh, meeting of the uh, Al Qaeda leaders, when Osama bin Laden, who was of course not that prominent in those times, he had actually issued a communique, a declaration of war against the United States. This was way back in 1994. And he had actually quoted the Quran, a certain verse of the Quran. Uh, it read out, Qatilu al kufr, which means that we will, we will wage war against these leaders of disbelief, referring to the United States. And it said that unless this war is won, we will continue with our goal. So you see that a person like Osama bin Laden and before him, uh, this this is not a new phenomenon. There have been other instances. And the thing is that they have cited the Quran. They have cited the Quran. And we know that William Gladstone, one of the uh, famous uh, prime ministers of the UK, he had the distinction of being the prime minister of Britain four times. So not one, not two, but he is the only prime minister of Britain to be the prime minister for four terms. He is reported to have said in one session of the parliament, of the, of the British uh, parliament, that unless the Quran exists, there can be no world peace. This is what he is alleged to have said. And uh, whether the reason is what the acts of terrorism that in those times, of course, this is the early, the late 19th century. So he was the prime minister of Britain from 1880s to uh, the first part of the 20th century. So the late 1800s 
and of course we don't have uh, the acts of uh, terrorism that we see today in that era, era which is about 130 or 40 years old but still a person like him is reported to have said that unless there is quran uh, as long as the quran exists we cannot have world peace and why because of course there are verses in the quran which tell muslims that they have to to allegedly kill the disbelievers they have to put them to the sword they have to extract jizya from them they have to make them subservient to themselves they cannot hold key posts or maybe uh, they can have, they cannot be people who can have primary responsibilities in an islamic state and so on and so forth there are a number of things which our fiqh actually discusses as a result of these quranic verses so uh, i know there are a lot of details that can be uh, that have to be divulged and that have to be uh, shared with you and i would advise you that if you would like to have a complete view of this uh, of the quranic verses uh, there is a small publication called playing god misreading a divine practice which is available uh, at from al mawrid and uh, which with the, the, these details can be seen but just to give you a su- short summary of how terrorism how extremism is justified in the name of religion in the name of islam and how wrongly it is done so and how these verses have a different context that uh, we need to understand not only the context but also get educated ourselves and also educate our children because you see people who are today living in the united states or in the uk or in, in australia and other and the parts of the world as minorities they are often faced with this scenario because they are bullied their children are often uh, put to shame by uh, actually making them realize that they are terrorists and they are disrupting world peace and they are not welcome in the in the localities that they are living so as i said uh, very briefly uh there is a divine practice which is mentioned in the quran specific for the messengers of god the first thing that we need to understand and that is the almighty says that during the time of his messengers of god he induces or he instigates or he initiates certain lesser days of judgment so that these lesser days of judgment can become a proof a substantiation of that greater day of judgment so in a nutshell what what the almighty's plan seems to be is that we keep forgetting the day of judgment in order to remind us of the day of judgment he has made a number of arrangements he has reminded us of the fact that the day of judgment has come because our own conscience is something which vouches for it and there are other arrangements as well but the strongest arrangement that the almighty has made to make us remind of the day of judgment is that he has actually made these judgment these days of judgment small days of judgment appear on the face of the earth during the times of his messengers of god so that these lesser days of judgment when they are witnessed in history through various scriptures like the quran and the bible the, the people like us they are reminded that this lesser day of judgment which occurred for example in the times of muhammad or in the times of moses or in the times of jesus or in the times of noha or abraham or other prophets of god they tell us that there is a day of judgment for which we do await ourselves the day of judgment of the nations of these messengers of god they met that day of judgment in their own lives and we have to meet our day of judgment the only thing is that our day of judgment is deferred they met their judgment in the lifetimes of their messengers as the last uh, progeny or the last nation of the last prophet for us or for the rest of the world this day of judgment deferred to the hereafter and that is why the quran actually is replete with the stories of the of the prophets of the past of the messengers of the past so that we while reading those stories can encapsulate the fact that we too are going to face a greater day of judgment now the manner in which these lesser day of judgment is brought about is that we, that a messenger of god delineates the truth before his addresses and these addresses are then uh explain the various truths they are given ample time to contemplate and there is a term which the quran says is itmamul hujja which means that the truth is conclusively conveyed to them that means that there is absolutely no semblance of doubt left in their minds that that what they are being told is not the truth you it's not because of any confusion nothing no confusion remains it is as if i am convinced what the truth is there is absolutely nothing left 
which can be of any cause of doubt. Such is the clarity of the truth which a messenger of God conveys. And then, if in spite of being convinced of this truth, a person or a group of people deny, it is they who are punished in this world, either through natural disasters, as was the case with the, the Ad, the Samud, and some of the ancient nations, or through the swords of the disbelievers, like was the case with Moses and Muhammad. And that is why, by the way, in one place in the Quran, Moses and Muhammad are called to be uh, all to be messengers who are very, very similar to each other. So what the Quran is actually telling us is that we need to understand that this is a the area in which these lesser days of judgment will take place. And when they take place, everything which is going to happen in the hereafter, for example, people are going to be punished in the hereafter. They are going to be rewarded in the hereafter. That reward and punishment is taking place on the face of this earth. And that is what happened in the lifetime of these messengers. So when they intentionally denied, the addressees intentionally denied the truth, they were punished. They were punished through various ways. People who were polytheistic or insisted on their polytheism, they were put to death. And people who were basically monotheists, which means that they professed in one God and were deviant in this belief, they were actually spared and given a lesser punishment. So this basically is, in a nutshell, an explanation of the fact that the all these verses of the Quran, which speak of, of actually punishing the disbelievers or killing them, they all relate to this law of the Almighty in which, during the times of, of messenger of God, people are put to death or punished in various ways because they had intentionally denied. This punishment is given to them by the Almighty himself through his messengers because the people were left with no excuse to deny the truth. So the Quran in a number of places says, They denied even after they were convinced from their inside that they were wrongdoers. Such is the extent of this conclusiveness. So uh, all the verses of the Quran, for example, which tells us, tell us that we have to kill the non-believers or the disbelievers, or for example, we should not uh, pay salutations the way, uh, this is, uh, by the way, mentioned in certain ahadiths, we should not say salam to the uh, non-believers, or as another Quranic verse says, that we should not make friends with uh, the Jews and Christians. All these verses and some of the other ones which pronounce this harshness are related to that era of the messenger of God in which once the truth has been communicated to these nations of God, they intentionally denied. And as a result of that intentional denial, they were put through various forms of punishment. So not making friends with them or imposing jizya upon them or not saying salam to them or not inheriting from them. Uh, all these are various forms of punishment which actually were given to the direct and the foremost addresses of a messenger of God, which tells which tells us that this is something that we need to know that this is going to happen with us as well. The only thing is that they met their fate in this world and we are going to meet our fate in the next world. And we have to remain on guard that this will happen one day. So you can see that this, this particular aspect of the Quran, unfortunately, has been missed out by many of our scholars. And I would here like to point out that the first person who gave this uh, indication or who for the first time actually vehemently stressed that we are missing out certain verses of the Quran or not interpreting them in the right context is that person which we often discuss, Imam Hamiduddin Farahi, a very, very exceptional person of the Indian subcontinent. He died in 1930. He was also a cousin of the famous theologian and historian Shibli Nomani. And uh, he was the uh, person who actually uh, directed our attention to some of these verses. And thereon, thereafter, we found his student, Amin Hassan Islai, and then the student of his student, Javed Ahmad Ghamadi, and some of the other contemporaries, pointing out to this very, very important aspect of the Quran in which all these harsh verses of the Quran have to be understood in their right context, that they relate to the messengers of God, to the to the foremost addresses of these messengers of God. They do not have any bearing on us. They are related to specific entities, to specific uh, background and circumstances. The only thing is that they are they exist in the Quran today to tell us that this is what happened with the nations of God, and this is what going, this is what going to happen to us as well, not here in the hereafter, if we adopt the same policy and the same uh, attitude of denial as these nations have adopted. So I, I know that this is something which needs more elaboration. I've just tried to touch upon this just to give you a basic inkling 
you can go through that book, Praying God, to go in more detail as to how uh, these verses are applied and how they are understood. But do you need to understand this, that as far as these verses of the Quran are concerned, which speak of killing the disbelievers or not making friends with them or have certain other harsh overtones, they are all related to a specific class and category of non-believers who are actually the direct or foremost addresses of the messengers of God. And they were actually given these punishments by the Almighty, not by any other human being, but by the Almighty himself through his appointed messengers so that this reward and punishment that takes place in these lesser days of judgment on the face of the earth becomes a corroboration, becomes a proof, becomes a substantiation of that greater day of judgment that's going to take place one day in the hereafter. So this is, uh, in a nutshell, I, what I wanted to explain regarding how terrorism, how uh, extremism is justified or killing in the name of Islam is justified by using a Quranic verse and unfortunately interpreting it out of context, unfortunately giving it something uh, of a background which it never has. It's not an absolute directive. It's a directive given in certain circumstances in a certain background. And we need to understand that background, educate ourselves and also educate our children regarding the basics and regarding the context of these, uh, these verses so that if they are bullied, so that if they are teased and harassed, they can tell us that this is an erroneous interpretation which has been made in the name of Islam. And let me tell you that this erroneous interpretation is not just from the Quran. It's equally from the Old Testament as well, because these punishments which are mentioned in the Quran uh, or the way they, the Quran deals with these non-believers, it's exactly the same as what the Old Testament or the Torah does with the disbelievers of that time as well. So it's not just the Quran. It's the Old Testament as well, which is exactly in line with what the Quran is saying. And when we explain the Quran in this way, we in fact are also trying to explain the scripture or the, or, or the Bible itself, where the Bible itself has become harsh, uh, so to speak, or given directives which are very similar uh, to what the Quran says as to kill people who are uh, afflicted with disbelief. So, so much for this uh, misconception. And uh, I hope that uh, it has stand clarified to some extent. But uh, if there are any questions, I, I would be very great. Uh, very, I would welcome them and uh, try to answer them. Um, Shah so if you uh, look at the names of attendees, uh, Safan has a question, Safan Ahmed. And then uh, Kashif Khan Saab has a question. The first one is Safan. So if you unmute his mic, he can go ahead. Right. Uh, is this mic now unmuted? If you click on the mic, it will. Safwan? Okay. Yes. Um, I don't see his name actually. Uh, uh, Safwan, go ahead. Uh, I say it's Muhammad Hashim and Kashif Khan are the people who have raised their hands. Probably. I'll open the mic uh, for you, Safwan. Go ahead with your question. There's a lot of background noise, I think there is a I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Uh, Shahzad Sahib, uh, Muhammad Hashim Sahib is next, if you can click on his mic, the orange mic. Right. So I'm trying to click it, but it refuses to be opened. They say the attendee has self-muted it. So, so uh, Hashim Sahib, unmute your mic and ask your question. My question is, uh, this, this phenomena that uh, Molana Farahi or the, or the mother, I mean, the, the mother of the Farahi that unfold this phenomena that the saza and all these ayat and the law that it happens in, uh, and the related to those people of that time and Allah SWT bring the give saza and make the decision of the uh, 
of the last as an example of the last day of judgment on those people when the Rasul comes to this world. We don't see any sign or such comments have been ever, ever given or discovered in the history of the prophethood or the uh, or the Sabai Kram or even Tabin, Ataba Tabin, throughout the history. What, what is the reason that none of the others have ever looked in, in that direction? Or is something that we are missing? When you speak about the Sahaba Karam, I don't think that this is the right uh, uh, interpretation. This, when the letters were sent by the Prophet himself to various uh, heads of the states, like to Syria and to, to the, Byzant the Byzantine Emperor, to Persian Emperor, to the King of Egypt, all of them actually said that he is actually invited, inviting them to the truth and he is telling them that uh, he is, has been appointed from the Almighty and that people who deny him are going to be punished. So I think that as far as the Sahaba are concerned, there is no, there was no doubt in their minds because they actually toppled the kingdoms of Persia and Byzantium in their minds. And they, in fact, quoted this, these same verses of the Quran when they did so. The problem has arisen because there are certain, uh, I would say, interpreters of the Quran of later times, which perhaps, who perhaps overlooked these uh, comments of the Sahaba themselves or these verses themselves. So it's not that you don't find any reference from the Prophet himself. As I said, the Prophet wrote these letters and he described what he is going to do in, the, in those letters. And when the Sahaba actually attacked Rome and, and Persia, they quoted these verses and they actually were, they, they had this thing in mind that they are extending or they are implementing the punishment of God on the disbelievers because they had intentionally denied the truth. What happened was that it was the later interpreters of the Quran who perhaps for some reason, which we have still to uh, discover uh, maybe, but uh, we do think that they, they, they were, there must be something which made them overlook this. Uh, but what exactly that was, we cannot, are not in a position to say. But the fact is that this happened much later, as I said, in the third or fourth centuries. And then when the fiqh was crystallized and when, for example, Abu Hanifa appeared on the scene or Imam Malik appeared on the scene and Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmad bin Humble, and then they, when their jurisprudence was adopted by various states of various countries, it was they then who interpreted this whole uh, attitude or this whole exercise of Sahaba in a different light. And then, uh, unfortunately, ever since their interpretation, which uh, came to light in the third century, all the way to the 14th century, now almost a thousand years, it has persisted with that. We have persisted with that. It was a person like Hamiduddin Farahi who once again directed our attention that we must go beyond these people, look before Abu Hanifa, look before these people and find out what the Sahaba themselves or the Prophet themselves or the Quran itself is talking about. So I, I understand this whole, uh, uh, this whole uh, situation or this whole scenario in the light of this approach. Thank you, Shida. So that's up. Uh, you have a question from Kashif Khan Saab. Um, Kashif Saab, you are self muted. Sure. So, thank you. Right. Kashif Saab, unmute your mic, please, and uh, ask your question. So maybe you've changed his mind. No, uh, he's, I think he's trying. Uh, Hello. So, you, fine now. Go ahead with yes, uh, I think you can hear me now. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, I can. Uh, my question is help me understand the New Testament, please. So, apparently, four out of 12, I believe, uh, survived today. And they appear to be like a chron chronological event of the Prophet Jesus. So, uh, what I don't understand is it like the actual Word of God, or is it just like the chronology of events that have uh, teachings of the God and also just a final comment according to Karen Armstrong's book the history of God it was I think the Greek uh, philosopher Anastasius uh, who about hundred years wow. later brought in the concept of Trinity uh, please help me or elucidate this thank you so, uh, as far as uh, the New Testament is concerned 
they these these gospels which were selected uh, by uh, a certain committee a uh, certain council of niche which we say actually conducted in 329 AD and out of the 30 or 34 gospels which were actually prevailing in uh, in those times it selected these four gospels and it classed them or classified them as the canonical gospels otherwise we have other gospels as well but they are uh, they are actually sub, they are consigned to the category of apocrypha or which are non canonical these are the four canonical gospels and they were actually originally uh, written in in greek uh, and we can see that language of jesus none of the gospels was written in their original language none of them basically the first time a gospel was written it was written in the greek language and that was around 70 years after uh, jesus had died and as far as the genre of these gospels is are concerned they are basically biographies i would say or or life histories of these of, of jesus himself through these uh, uh, researchers people who are just, have actually written them so basically it's like saying that they are by bio, uh, different bio, biographies of of uh, jesus by these people and within these biographies we find words of jesus interspersed as if he's speaking himself and that is why there are instances there are scholars who have actually uh, authored a red lettered bible which means that during this uh, during the instance of these gospels he has underlined or he has actually uh, made the red A, a red statement appear wherever jesus is speaking himself on behalf of the almighty as if it's a divine inspiration so within these biographies within these four gospels wherever jesus is speaking on behalf of god that has been put into red so that you can see that in this bio biography the part which is divine can be singled out or can be set apart now as far as the question of trinity is concerned we have a lot of debate on trinity as to who was its uh, inventor and who brought it out first karen am strong is has one view there are several other views i would i would advise you that you look at look up it's not that that easy uh, that a person a single person can be actually uh, singled out there are a lot of debates but uh, that's something which is consigned to history thank you shahzad so uh, so we'll try safan again safan your mic is muted on from your end go ahead can you hear me Yes, I can. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, please okay. go ahead. I can hear you. All right. So, so my question is that uh, I'm I'm a little confused on the the two concepts uh, that the uh, Quran describes that you know itmam uh, hujjat where your punishment is coming because the last prophet has. uh proved uh the truth uh, upon the people of that time at the same time uh quran says that you have the freedom of uh, believing or choosing not to believe these two concepts kind of contradict in my mind and how does that uh, uh you know actually uh, sort out uh, that's that's first part of my question the second part of the question is that uh considering the fact that the quran is very contextual book handing over a uh, a translation of quran to a non muslim would i don't think would be a good idea what what's your thought on that thank you so as far as your first question is concerned uh, which actually relates to like rahaf uddin uh, and the fact that there is this quest, uh, issue of itmam al hujja uh, so on the one hand the quran seems to say that people are absolutely free to choose what right and wrong is there is no compulsion regarding right and wrong and on the other hand it says that if they choose wrong they will be punished so i don't think there is any any, any discrepancy or any contradiction uh, what the quran here is telling us is that the choice of adopting righteousness or something which is wrong is our, on our own self it's not that god has compelled us to righteousness or god is, has compelled us to accept what uh, uh, wrong is it's our choice we have the freedom to choose between right and wrong but as far as the consequence of right and wrong is concerned that is an entirely different thing so these two verses relate to two different scenarios there is one a scenario in which i will say that i am not going to force my opinion on you you are free to choose what right and wrong is however if you choose wrong uh, it's out of your own choice you are going to suffer or you're going to put through this uh, scenario because of certain uh, thing that you have done so i would say that 
uh, this reconciliation between these two verses has to be looked upon in the fact that the Almighty is not forcing us to accept right or wrong per se. It's leaving right and wrong to our own choice. And much to that choice, we will be responsible that whatever we choose, whether it's right or wrong, if it's right, it's going to have good consequences. If it is wrong, it's, it's going to have bad consequences. So I, I think that these are two entirely different scenarios. And uh, I, I, could you remind me of your second question? Yeah, the, the second question is that uh, since the Quran is a very contextual book, you cannot take it out of right. the context. So, as it's yeah, very clear. Absolutely, yeah. I, I, I remember now. So you're absolutely right in your second question that uh, because of this extremely specific nature of the Quran, uh, when you hand hand over the Quran to a non-Muslim, uh, there is bound to be this uh, this aspect in which uh, he, when he, whenever he reads certain verses of the Quran, which are actually lambasting him or uh, taking him to task, or maybe uh, in his own interpretation, he thinks that the way the Jews and the Christians are being dealt with in the Quran, and since he presumably is also a Jew or a Christian, so it's like uh, being bashed upon one after the other uh, without uh, any perhaps plausible reason. So I would say that there are two things that we can do as as a means, as as a, as a as something which can be of a preemptive nature. The first is that. Uh, at al more at our institute we have developed a small booklet uh, which is called uh, introduction to the quran which actually introduces the quran in about 10 15 pages to a non-muslim reader as to what the book is and how it approaches non-muslims and how we must not confuse the non-muslims of the times of the prophet with the non-muslims of today and how the two are different and how the quran actually correlates them so this is something that you will find that is going to be published very soon in the next maybe month, one month or so. It's a short booklet which is meant for this very purpose that you, before you hand over the Quran to a non-Muslim, you give him or her uh, introduction to this, this uh, work of uh, the Almighty. And then you give uh, the translation of the Quran. But other than that, let me also tell you that uh, it's the strange are the ways of the Lord. You see, uh, however much we humans would like to prepare other people for what God is actually saying or not saying, you see, the, the book itself, there is something in the book itself which does communicate a lot to non-believers because, you see, it's not just this issue of how the Quran is dealing with the non-Muslims. The Quran is, is, a, is an amalgam of, of, of so many other things which inspire people to come closer to God. For example, the concept of Tawheed or oneness of the Almighty. The concept of the fact that you are subservient to a single God that has the single most profound appeal. So even if people don't understand this aspect of the Quran in which they seem they might get confused that the Quran is speaking very harshly regarding non-Muslims or the punishment of the non-Muslims or issues like jihad. Uh, in spite of this, people have continued to accept Islam ever since the time of the Prophet, even though this particular aspect of Ithmam al hujjah was not always clear to them. Why? Because, as I said, the Quran has a diverse appeal. If it, if there is a confusion of, if there is something which is not answered by the this issue of uh, conclusive communication of the truth or Ithmam al hujjah it is actually covered, or I would say, uh, in, in a broad sense, that it has so many other ways of making other people realize that it is from a book from God that they cling to the, those other other ways as well. But as I said, since this is a uh, is a phenomenon which has occurred in the last 40 or 50 years in which terrorism, extremism, and killing people has become more rampant. So therefore, this, these particular verses of the Quran now stand out much more than they used to 50 years ago. 50 years ago, when there was no such terrorist, terrorist activity, although we still, had, we still had verses in the Quran, but still, since they were not acted upon, so that's, that part of the Quran was, I would say, uh, not as disturbing to a newly converted Muslim or a person who was coming closer to Islam. But today, 50 years, in the last 40 or 50 years, where Quranic verses are being cited in favor of terrorism, uh, is, is this need that we, ha make, we have to make our non-Muslim friends understand where the Quran is coming from. Why is it becoming harsh? And where is this law of Imam al has actually originated from? It's not, not just the Quran. The Old Testament, the New Testament, they also speak and refer to this law. So that is the problem that I wanted to uh, to, to so, sort of highlight as well. 
that basically it's because of this terrorist, terrorist activity which has become rampant in the last 40 or 50 years that we need to give a non-Muslim reader this introduction of the Quran before we hand over the Quran itself to them. I hope there's going to be a PDF version of that available on the website. Yes, we have a PDF version and uh, that will be uploaded on our websites. I think it should play, take place somewhere in, uh, for the end of next month, inshallah. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Dr. Saab. Uh, uh, if we are unable to take anyone else's question, uh, our apologies for that, but the class time is over. So if you don't mind, uh, uh, click on file and uh, end webinar um, from the main menu. And inshallah, okay. we'll meet next Saturday. Inshallah, we'll see you next time. Okay, khuda hafiz.